The English language is a fascinating language. Many of the words that we use in the English language were derived from other languages. We are indebted to Latin, to Greek, and other languages of Europe and other places. Many people do not realize how many words actually come from Greek words. When we come to theology, we find this is a case for example, we talk about theology. It comes from theos, God, and logos, study or word. Christology, the study of Christ. Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Hamatiology, the study of sin. Archaeology, study of ancient things. And uh, there are other words that we are not associated with uh, theology, such as uh, cosmology and geology, and psychology and sociology, that all have connections with Greek. And the topic I'm going to talk about today also comes from the Greek. It's called eschatology. Eschatos is the Greek word for the end or last things. And logos is the study of last things. And when we come to look at the Bible, <clears throat> we notice that there are two expressions used to describe end times. One is the time of the end, and another is the last days. Are these two synonymous, or do they refer to two different uh, time periods? However, singly or overlapping. Seventh-day Adventists have long been known as people interested in eschatology or the study of last-day events. However, in the study of, the, of this important subject, we need to keep our anchor firmly gripped in the Bible and uh, in the spirit of prophecy so that we avoid the mistakes that some have made. First of all, I want to look at the time of the end. As a people, we have traditionally believed and taught that the time of the end began in 1798 at the end of the 1260 year period referred to in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. For example, Daniel 7:26 and Revelation 12:14 and 13 verse 5. Ellen White commented on this time period in the following words. This period, 1260 years, this period ended in 1798. The events of 1798, for those that do not recognize it, was a time when the General Berthier of the French army invaded Italy and took the Pope a prisoner back to France to Avignon, where he died in exile. It marked the end of papal domination in Europe, a significant event in history. Quoting again from Ellen White, the time of the end began in 1798 at the end of the 1260 year period, or prophecy referred to in Daniel Revelation. This period, she says, ended in 1798. The coming of Christ could not take place before that time. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 covers with his caution the whole of the Christian dispensation down to the year 1798. It is this side, he says, of that time that the message of Christ's second coming is to be proclaimed. Later on, on the same page, Ellen White wrote, but since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed. Knowledge of the prophecies has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. However, there is another spirit of prophecy quote that I want to refer to. 
<clears throat> this quotation from her about the time of the end really may have commenced at 1844 rather than in 1798. Let's listen to what she wrote. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, speaking about uh, Daniel's pro uh, Revelation's prophecy, John's prophecy about the book that was sealed. It was sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach. She said, the book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the book of the prophecies of Daniel, which relate to the last days. The scripture says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth, by the increase of knowledge of people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. As any student of Seventh-day Adventist prophetic interpretation knows, Revelation chapter 10 is understood by us to refer to the 1844 disappointment, and that the expression, time shall be no longer, has been understood to refer to the end of prophetic time with the termination of the 2,300-day period in 1844. Thus, some people think this Ellen G. White statement could be understood to refer to the 1844 date as the time when the time of the end began. However, whether we take 1798 or 1844 as the beginning of the time of the end, all of us are agreed that today we are most certainly living in that period so called by Scripture when the final events are transpiring and soon the great consummation is to take place. Now let's look at the biblical last days. While the time of the end is prophetically that short period of time just before the return of Jesus, the Bible, especially the New Testament, often speaks about the whole Christian era as the last days. For example, Peter quoted Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, on the day of Pentecost in AD 31, and said that the prophet Joel had prophesied that in the last days God would pour out his Spirit upon all flesh. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 reads, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Paul declared in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that, quote, these things are written for our admonition upon whom the Ends of the world are come. And there are other verses that speak of the Apostles' Day as the last days. For example, 1 Peter 1.20, Christ was manifest in these last times for you. And 1 John 2.18, little children, it is the last time. We know that it is the last time. Now on the surface of these verses, it poses a problem when placed beside Daniel's statement that we have looked at above. The best way to solve this apparent contradiction is to say that the expression time of the end and the expression the last days, as far as their use by Bible writers was concerned, referred to two different time periods. This may be illustrated by the following diagram. We have the crucifixion. And from the crucifixion to the second advent, we have the biblical last days. But from 1798 to 1844 area to the second coming, in fact, even to the end of the millennium, we have the biblical and prophetic time of the end. 
so that these periods do overlap. From about 1798 to the Second Coming, they are running parallel, but they do have a different beginning and different ends. Theologians have long recognized the situation of a two-fold approach to the subject of eschatology. Firstly, that they really began in AD 31 with the death of Jesus on the cross, and yet that eschatology is very much a subject uh, for our time. To help express this twofold truth, they have coined expressions which, though not found in Scripture, help us to understand the situation. They speak about inaugurated eschatology, that is, events that were centred around the cross, the death of Jesus, when he paid the price for our redemption. And the other expression is consummated eschatology, which deals with those events that occur or will occur right at the end of time with the beginning of those events that lead to the second coming of Jesus and the millennium. First of all, let us look at inaugurated eschatology. This term was used by J.H.T. Robinson. The term refers to events that center on Calvary, when Jesus died as man's substitute, and surety. The term does not only refer to what wicked men did to Jesus in crucifixion, but to what God accomplished in Christ when he gave his only son as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. In fact, it is really to the latter that this term refers, as we shall later see. Sometimes they use the term realized eschatology, and that is used to, because the events that then transpired are history. They have been realized. They're past now. They are now historical facts. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, Bible writers could claim that they were citizens of heaven. If they belonged to Jesus, their claim would be true even though they were still living on this sinful earth. It is because we who believe are citizens of heaven that we are admonished so often to live accordingly. Now I'm going to come to look at eschat uh, consummated eschatology. This term is used to refer to events that surround the second coming of Christ. That is, to refer to God's acts in bringing everything he is planning to do in saving men to its uh, consummation or final fulfillment or fruition. This then would include such things as the investigative or the pre-advent judgment, the close of probation, the second coming, the millennium, and all that is involved and the final judgment scene and the destruction of the wicked and the resurrection, uh, sorry, and the recreation of this earth to make it the final dwelling place for redeemed mankind. Thus, these two may be illustrated as follows. We have inaugurated eschatology beginning at the cross, and that goes through to the end of the millennium. But from 1798 to 1844, we have Consummate eschatology going down to the end of time. Let's have a look now at a very interesting passage in the book of Daniel. One of the prophecies of Daniel 9 referred to events that were to tran be transfer transformed or to be performed during the 70 weeks of that prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Here we are told certain events would take place within the 70 weeks specified in that prophecy. Here we are given the list of events which were to transpire with the coming of the Messiah and with his sacrifice. Let us examine some of these and see how they fit into the above pattern of inaugurated and consummated eschatology. The first one, Daniel 9.24. 
to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins. By his death on the cross, Jesus legally brought sin and transgression to an end. He paid the penalty so that man could go free. Thus, sin is no more a barrier for the human race. In this desire for salvation, it is very important, especially for us who have to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Yet we all know that Christ's death did not put an end to sin in the ultimate sense before there is evidence all around us that sin still exists in the world. In fact, we are told that as we get nearer the second advent, quote, evildoers and seducers will wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13 Yet in a very real way, God will finish transgression and sin by destroying those who cling to it at the end of the millennium. Thus we see the difference between what will happen within the 70 weeks and that which would take place at the end of the millennium. The former comes under the heading of inaugurated eschatology. The latter is part of consummated eschatology. Now let's look at another expression, Daniel 9.24. To bring in everlasting righteousness. In the same way, Jesus, by his death on the cross, made it legally possible for all men to be counted as righteous in him. Yet, even believers at times fall into sin when they are tempted, even if it is unintentional. So we cannot say that everlasting righteousness has been brought in in the ultimate or consummated sense. Then the third point, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. As those events that were to transpire within the 70 weeks were fulfilled, that is, the inaugurated eschatology that we have looked at, our confidence is to be placed in God's assurance that the events connected with consummated eschatology, the events prophesied, are pointed out as taking place at the end of the 2,300 days would also take place as predicted. Let us first now consider the judgment. Because this twofold approach to eschatology is not recognized by all, some have made the mistake of giving total or undue attention to inaugurated eschatology and neglecting the subject of consummated eschatology. This is seen in several areas of theology, and one of this is in the area of the judgment. It is true to say that as man's substitute, Jesus bore the penalty of man's sin at Calvary, that he endured the wrath of God against sin and sinners there on our behalf, and that in Christ the world was judged and in a sense punished. Note the words of Jesus in John 12, Verse 31, which was spoken on the eve of his crucifixion. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. However, this does not destroy the equally true fact that in consummated eschatology, God would conduct a work of judgment at the end time. We as Seventh-day Adventists believe that the investigative judgment began in 1844. And may I pause here to explain the terminology investigative judgment is uh, being less used by Adventist theologians in recent years. We are now talking more about the pre-Advent judgment. And while there are many Christians of various denominations are coming to realize that there will be a judgment prior to the second coming, they do not link it in with 1844. But there are more Christians today talking about a necessity of a pre-Advent judgment before the second coming because we're told in the book of Revelation that Jesus comes with his reward for his saints. And if he's bringing his reward, he needs to decide who's going to get that reward before he comes. Therefore, it is a pre-Advent judgment. 
After all, the terminology investigative judgment has the idea that uh, God is investigating to find out something he does not know. Whereas the scripture tells us that God is omniscient, that is all-knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything. There's nothing that he does not know. So God is not investigating to find out something he doesn't know, but he's conducting an investigation because he's being watched by the universe. And the universe needs to see that God judges fairly and accurately and justly and that he makes no mistakes. If people were not satisfied about God's justice, it could give rise to sin coming again the second time into the universe of God. And God is not going to take that risk or allow that to happen. <clears throat> Later on, there will be a judgment during the millennium, a judgment of the wicked. We read about this in Revelation chapter 20 where the saints are given thrones to sit upon and judgment is given unto them. And at the end of the millennium, there is an executive phrase of judgment and the wicked will be punished. Now it is true that Jesus died for all men. And in this death, if this death is accepted, the penalty for all sins is taken care of for all men. But this does not mean that the wicked who reject God's provision of salvation will escape their punishment or their judgment in the future. To hold to such a view would lead to the doctrine of universalism, which says that all men will ultimately be saved and not one person will be lost. This is a false teaching, and the Bible certainly makes it plain that uh, it is not a teaching that we can believe. Now let's look at the question, when are men saved? This question is bound to call forth more than one answer, even in some Adventist circles. Those who focus on the Calvary event will answer at the cross and will quote 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Again, in a sense, it is true that we were saved legally and potentially in AD 31 at the cross. But since none of us were born then, we cannot say we were saved in an absolute way at that time. When we accept what God has done for us in Christ in AD 31 at the cross, then we can say we are saved in the sense that our sins are forgiven and we are accounted righteous in God's sight. But even though we are then saved from the power of sin, we still need to be saved from the presence of sin. And it is only when the latter of these two aspects is completed that we will be able to say we are saved in the ultimate sense. This aspect of salvation is part of consummated eschatology. Now what about the atonement? Perhaps in no other area than the atonement is this dichotomy more revealed. Most evangelicals view the atonement in a narrow sense and see it as only that which was accomplished at the cross. They talk much about the finished work of Jesus on the cross. When I was in language school in India years ago with evangelical Christians studying language to prepare me for my work as a missionary in India, I heard evangelicals talking frequently about Christ's finished work, his finished work at the cross. They're emphasizing inaugurated eschatology. Hence they say that the atonement was made at the cross. Seventh-day Adventists have a broader definition of atonement. That is, that it takes in all that God does to reconcile man to himself. That is, it is not limited to atonement only at the cross. Though we include it, to say that atonement only refers to the cross event is to focus exclusively on inaugurated eschatology and to fail to see the aspect of atonement that rightly comes under consummated eschatology. Some early Seventh-day Adventists made the mistake of declaring that Jesus did not make the atonement on the cross, but is making it now in the priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. 
And if you want source for that, it's Movements of Destiny, page 167, 173. You can go and look up that reference and confirm it. Some early Seventh-day Adventists made the mistake of declaring that Jesus did not make the atonement on the cross, but that he is making it now in his priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. The truth of the matter is that atonement theologically begins or belongs to both areas of eschatology. No one has this, had this clearer in mind than did Ellen White. Note what she said about atonement at the cross. Jesus said upon his ascension, open quotes, I have completed the work of redemption, close quotes. Open quotes on another one. Christ's sacrifice in behalf of man was full and complete. The condition of the atonement had been fulfilled. And that's from Acts of the Apostles, page 29. Another quote. His offering of himself was full and complete. Nothing was wanting. It was indeed a whole and ample atonement that was made. That's our high calling, page 136. Type met anti-type in the death of Christ, the lamb slain for the sins of the world. Our great high priest has made the only sacrifice that is of any value in our salvation. When he offered himself on the cross, a perfect atonement was made for the sins of the people. And that is a quote from the Signs of the Times article, June 28, 1899, from the pen of Ellen White. And there are other statements she made that say the same thing. Of course, this concept fits in perfectly with the scriptures. This is as we would expect it. See, for example, John 19.30, where it is recorded that Jesus himself declared as he was about to die, it is finished. And in Hebrews 9.28, 10.10 and 10.12 and 10.14, we read that Jesus was once offered, past tense, and made one sacrifice for sins forever. That's a quotation. One sacrifice for sins forever. And other similar statements. As we have noticed, Seventh-day Adventists have a broader definition of atonement. We do accept that Jesus made atonement at the cross. But since God has not yet finished with the sin problem, we include in our concept his present acts in this regard. For example, the priestly work of Jesus. The antitype of the atonement made by the priests in the earthly sanctuary may also be included in atonement. See Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20, and other verses there. Ellen White speaks about Jesus making the final atonement in her writings for believers, and that he would do this in the heavenly sanctuary at the conclusion of the second department or second phase of his heavenly sanctuary ministry. You find a reference to that in Great Controversy, 480 and elsewhere. Ellen White speaks about these things. This work includes the blotting out of the record of the sins of those who are sealed and who are to be translated when Jesus comes. This aspect of atonement must certainly fit into the area of consummated eschatology. Another aspect of atonement that fits into the area of consummated eschatology is that which is prefigured by the scapegoat transaction. Note carefully the wording of Leviticus 16, verse 10. Quote, But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to get, let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Close quotes. Contrary to the opinion of some people, we as Seventh-day Adventists do not, uh, have not been rather alone in seeing the scapegoat as a type of Satan, making a full rec uh, uh, application of this important type. You can read an article by Robert Parr in the Signs of the Times, Australian edition, July 1, page 1966 pages 10 to 12 and page 31, where Robert Pyle lists a whole list of theologians of various denominations who agree with our position on that point. It is certain, <clears throat> it certainly is the last act that God deals with the sin problem when he <clears throat> uh, 
cleanses the heavenly sanctuary of its record of sins and puts them on Satan, then the universe can be at a state of at one meant with him. That the word atonement is broken up into at one meant, a state of being at one with God. Now in conclusion, I want to stress the need for balance. Thus we have seen that there is scriptural support for the theological concept of inaugurated eschatology at the cross, but this does not deny the clear teachings of Scripture about events that are to transpire at the end of time which belong to consummated eschatology. One of Satan's devices to deceive souls is to lead them to destruction, is to cause them to become unbalanced in their views of these two areas of eschatology. For example, when men go to an extreme position on the former, they are led to view the events of the cross as the all and in all of Christian belief and practice. The people around us say, Jesus did it all. He is my substitute. I have nothing to do. Jesus kept the law for me. Therefore, I do not have to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> Such an overemphasis on inaugurated eschatology often leads to antinomianism, which is a attitude anti-law, against the law. Talk about the law being abolished, we don't have to keep it, and things like that. And a belittling of those events which are, belong to the area of consummated eschatology. Get their theology out of balance. By the same token, an overemphasis on consummated eschatology often leads to a belittling of those, those events that took place at the cross. And the heavy emphasis on subjects such as the investigative or pre-advent judgment and sanctification, especially as it relates to the reaching of a standard to pass in the judgment. This overemphasis takes one's eyes away from Jesus and his merits in which we are to trust for salvation and results in a type of legalistic religion. Further, if this approach, in this approach, the assurance of salvation is often lacking because one is never sure that the required standard has been reached. You see, I remember an earlier Adventist evangelist preaching that when we become Christians, we are in a sense married to Christ. And he said, you ask somebody, are you a Christian? Have you been saved? And they reply, well, I, I think I am. I hope I am. A man can only do his best, you know. He said, what would you think if I ask a man, are you married? And he said, well, I think I am. I hope I am. A man can only do his best, you know. <laughs> we, we would rubbish him. Then why do we take such a negative attitude and uncertainty about our status with Jesus when we have made a commitment to him? Notice the warning that Ellen G. White gave us in regard to these possible two extremes of error. Quoting from Steps to Christ, page 61 to 63, there are two errors against which the children of God, particularly those who have just come to trust in his grace, especially need to guard. The first is that of looking to their own works, trusting in anything they can do to bring themselves into harmony with God. He who is trying to become holy by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. All that men can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. The opposite and no less dangerous error is that belief in Christ releases men from keeping the law of God. That since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. These statements from Ellen White remind me of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. 
You can't earn a gift. Wages of sin is death. But the wages of righteousness is, on our part is not eternal life. Only the righteousness of Jesus credited to us is what will get us through to the kingdom. Thus, the true believer will always strive for a sound balance in his views regarding eschatology and be on guard against extreme views on either side of this important question. As we have seen, this balance has not always been maintained by believers. May God grant us more than human wisdom that we may keep the balance that he wants us to keep. And then we deal with the consummation, that is, the final acts of God in eradicating sin and sinners. These events are grouped together into what we have seen and the Bible calls the time of the end. We are now living in this time. According to our understanding of the Bible prophecies, these events include the advent, uh, investigative or pre-advent judgment, which we believe began on October 22, 1844, when Jesus took up the second phase of his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. This judgment will end with the close of probation when Jesus ceases to minister as our high priest. Please note that Jesus again will say, it is done as he ends his priestly work. As he said on the cross when he died, he could say it then because all that he came to do in this world he had accomplished just before he finished his life here and gave his life a the sacrifice on the cross for us. Then the seven last plagues will fall on those who have rejected the gospel. This will be followed by the second advent of Jesus, who will come back to earth and take his people back to heaven to be with him. Here it is interesting to note that Jesus used the then future destruction of Jerusalem as a type of the still future end of the world, Matthew chapter 24. Then will follow the millennium, described in Revelation chapter 20, where for a thousand years the saints will be in heaven engaging in a work of judgment on the wicked. This is to ensure that no doubts will ever arise in the mind of anyone as to God's justice. If throughout eternity all are satisfied that God is just, it will be a safeguard against the possibility that sin might return. At the end of the millennium, the saints return to the earth with Jesus. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, will descend. The wicked will then surround and try to capture it, Revelation chapter 20. It is then that fire comes down from God out of heaven, and they are destroyed. From the ashes of the old world, God will create a new one, wherein righteousness and peace will dwell forever. This will be the final consummation of the plan of salvation. Ellen White describes the scene in these words, which constitute the last paragraph of the book, Great Controversy, between Christ and Satan. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshattered beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. God grant that we all may witness that consummation. If you enjoyed this presentation, it is from my series, The Gospel in the Setting of End Time Events. See all of these videos in the playlist shown now. Should you have any questions, feel free to contact your local Seventh-day Adventist minister or church. Please see the description below the video for more information.